Amen. Today's talk is entitled Chutzpah with the Judge. Everyone say Chutzpah. Chutzpah. Chutzpah is a Jewish word. It means boldness. It means dogged determination. It means tenacity. It means refusing to let go when you want something. It's having chutzpah. And in the Holy Bible, we are encouraged by Jesus. We are encouraged by God to have lots and lots of chutzpah. Okay, we are never kind of taught as Christians to be these kind of, in the wrong way, lowly, meek, kind of pathetic, I mustn't ask God for anything because I'll offend him sort of people. No, we are commanded to be bold, courageous, to have a bit of chutzpah about us when we pray and when we seek God. Now, there was once a man called Charles Finney. Who's ever heard of Charles Finney? Charles Finney was an amazing evangelist and revivalist in America. The church didn't like him very much, but the common people liked him because he preached the truth of the Bible. You see, the church in Finney's day, they kind of watered down the message. They wanted to tickle people's ears. They didn't want to offend anybody unnecessarily. But Charles Finney said, hey, this is God's word. I'm going to preach it as it's written. So he preached it as, as it was written and the church didn't like him for it. However, Charles Finney led hundreds of thousands of people to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because God blessed him for preaching the truth. This is what Charles Finney said. A revival may be expected when Christians have a spirit of prayer for revival. That is when they pray as if their hearts were set upon it. When Christians have the spirit of prayer for a revival. When they go about groaning out their heart's desire when they have real travail of soul for revival. That's when a revival may be expected, according to Charles Finney, a man who saw countless revivals. Another man was a man called John Wesley. Who's ever heard of John Wesley before? John Wesley was an Anglican minister in the Church of England. But there was a problem. John Wesley began to read the Bible for himself. And he began to realize that what the Church of England was teaching concerning the Word of God is not actually what the Word of God taught. And so John Wesley got saved. He actually trusted in the death, the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. And he got saved. He got born again and he had a living relationship with God. And because of this, the Church of England hated John Wesley. They despised John Wesley. And do you know what they did? They kicked him out of every church he preached in. If he went to a Church of England church and preached the gospel, the vicar in that church got so angry, they said, get out of my church and never come back. And they slammed the doors on him. So everywhere John Wesley went, the Church of England despised him. In fact, the common people didn't like him very much either. For those of you who are young, cover your ears at this point. There were occasions when people would climb up trees to relieve themselves on John Wesley as he was preaching. They would take dead rats and dead pieces of cat and chuck them at him because they hated his preaching so much. And why did they hate his preaching so much? Because he preached what the Holy Bible actually taught. And John Wesley led hundreds of thousands of people to Jesus Christ because the power of God was with him. This is what John Wesley says. God's command to pray without ceasing is founded on the necessity we have of his grace to preserve the life of God in the soul, which can no more subsist one moment without it than the body can without air. Another guy called Evan Roberts, who's ever heard of Evan Roberts? He was a 26 year old miner in South Wales. He preached the gospel true and straight. In nine months, he saw a revival in South Wales where more than 100,000 people accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. The church at the time, the religious church, didn't like him very much because he preached the truth of the Bible. And here is a diary account, or sorry, a letter from a diary from Evan Roberts on November the 6th, 1904. And he explains one week into the revival, how the revival is beginning to spread. Listen to his words. Dear Flory, 
We had the Spirit with us throughout last week. And last night, three girls and one man were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Oh, it was an awesome meeting. Every person present was praying this prayer. Send the Holy Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. This was a circle prayer. Each one had to pray. Oh, the effect was marvelous. And while the prayer was going on, one of our young men was filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise him. Yes, yes. When this had gone around, we began again, this time with the addition, send the Holy Spirit more powerfully. Send the Spirit now more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. If you want to know why revival spread over South Wales, that's the key right there. Everybody in the church prayed, Father, send the Holy Spirit now. And once they had prayed that, they prayed a second prayer. Father, send the Holy Spirit now even more powerfully for Jesus' sake. And revival sparked all over South Wales. A hundred thousand people were radically converted to Jesus Christ. Sick people were healed of all kinds of diseases. Drunkards were set free of alcoholism. There was that one account I've shared with you as a young man. He went out drinking every night. His father prayed for him. He went to the pub and he tried to pick up his pint of beer. But there was something like a force field around it. No matter how hard he tried, he, he couldn't touch the glass. And he found out later that his father had been praying for him to be set free from his alcohol addiction. And he turned to Jesus Christ. These are the sorts of miracles that were occurring because a group of people in a church were crying out to God, God, send your spirit for Jesus' sake. You see, prayer doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be full of King James English and these and thous and whatsoever's. It just has to be from the heart. It has to burn within the soul of man. And when you get a Finney, when you get a Wesley, when you get a, a Roberts, when you get a Whitfield, men or a, a woman of God who is filled with the Holy Spirit, whose hearts burn with a passion for the living God, when they pray, heaven listens. Yes. And the glory and the power of the Spirit of God comes down. Let's turn to Luke 18 verses 1 to 8. This is a familiar passage, but we need to look over it again. And this is the teaching of Jesus to his disciples then. And it's a teaching of Jesus to us today as his disciples. Very important. So let's pin back our spiritual ears and listen to what Christ is saying here. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable or a story to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. So there's this widow. She's got an adversary. She's lost her husband. She doesn't have a man to fight for her. And so she comes before the judge of the town and she knocks on his door and she cries out to him, give me justice against my adversary. I've got no husband to help me. I've got no one on my side. I'm all by myself. Please judge, give me justice against my adversary. But the judge didn't fear God. He didn't really care about justice. He didn't care about what people thought of him. He had a job, he had a position, he was getting paid well. Perhaps he was in, in bed, perhaps he was eating a nice warm meal. He didn't really care about this widow. So he ignored her. He put her off. Come back tomorrow, he said. She came back tomorrow. She knocked on his door again. Judge, give me justice against my adversary. I've got no one to fight for me. I need your help. Come back tomorrow, he said. Keeps putting her off, not caring. The next day she comes back again, this time a little bit more angry, a little bit more determination, a little bit more chutzpah. She bangs on his door again. Judge, get up, come and help me. She knew that if she kept banging on his door, the judge would eventually get up and give her 
some attention. You see, in Israel, in Jesus' time, Jewish people, they prayed three times a day, every day. They would pray at 9 a.m. in the morning. They would pray at 12 noon. And they would pray at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And also in between those times, the early Christians were also to be encouraged to pray continually. So you had three set times of prayer. And then throughout the day, they were also encouraged to pray continually and to be in that attitude of prayer, giving thanks to God for everything that he does. This is Jesus' teaching to his early church. And that's why the early church absolutely exploded with the power of God. It wasn't because they were particularly clever. They weren't. They were tax collectors, fishermen. They weren't particularly bright. They didn't go to a rabbinical training school. They were not particularly gifted with public speaking skills, oratory skills. The Apostle Paul was called a babbler. What's this babbler trying to say? He's not much of a speaker. So they weren't very good at speaking. They weren't very intellectual. Many of them were not that good looking or charismatic. They were not very wealthy, so they couldn't wear the finest of clothes. But the one thing they did have on their side is that they prayed. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And do you know what they prayed for? The power of God, the filling of the Holy Spirit, for God to stretch forth his hand in signs, wonders and miracles. The early church devoted themselves to prayer, prayer, prayer. And because of that, they saw the power of God break out in Jerusalem. And today the church exists all over the world because that early church in Jerusalem prayed their socks off. And when you pray, the power of God comes down. Verse 4, it continues. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. You see, day after day, Night after night, this widow kept on banging on the judge's door. He kept telling her to go away. He kept on trying to ignore her. But every day her chutzpah increased. She got more and more zealous, more and more fervent, more and more passionate about prayer. She was banging on the door, maybe chucking stones at his window. She was bothering him day and night. At first he could put up with it. At first it was kind of like, well... She's gone away now, I'll forget about her. But after maybe a week went by, two weeks went by, maybe a month of this, day after day, night after night, banging on the door, chucking stones at the window, crying out, shouting, making a disturbance, making a nuisance of herself. Finally, it drove the judge so mad. He said, I have to go and help this woman, otherwise she will not leave me alone. And beyond that, he was actually scared now for his own safety. He was scared to leave the house. He was scared to go down to the marketplace to buy himself some food in case the woman saw him and in her chutzpah and zeal and passion, she came over and attacked him. He was frightened for his own safety. He says so right there. I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. He was scared to leave his house now because of her chutzpah, because of her passion, because she was crying out and banging on the door so much. Verse 6, and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out? Everyone say cry out. Cry. Who whisper out to him. <laughs> that, ooh, what's that word again? Cry. What, does it, what does it mean to cry out? Shout. Shout. Look at how God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, look at how God in the flesh teaches us to pray. These little words, sometimes we just skim over, we just read over and go, oh, okay, right. cry out, yep. He doesn't say whisper out. Who cry out to him day and night. And night. Oh, day and night. When does the daytime happen? When, the sun comes up. when does nighttime happen? The sun goes down. Okay, so God expects us to pray 
during the day and during the night. Not just pray, not just whisper. What does he expect us to do? Cry out. Shout. Shout. Have chutzpah. Moan and groan. Make some volume, make some noise. You see, in the UK, unfortunately, the Christianity that we received was kind of Roman Catholicism. But Roman Catholicism is not the same as the Christianity you read about in the Bible. They're two, two completely different things. In Roman Catholicism, you're saved by faith plus works, observing of works. You're encouraged to seek the help of dead saints and so on and so forth. And you have the clergy and the laity division and you're to be very, very quiet and reverent. And then out of the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of England was born and it carried on a lot of the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. And then out of the Church of England, the, the Baptists and the Methodists and the Pentecostals and the Evangelicals came. And so in the British church today, we have this kind of weird religious mindset that's been handed down to us basically by the Roman Catholic Church that there is a division between clergy and laity. The person at the front is more holy and more special to God than the people sat down in the pews or the chairs. God's wallet. We're all priests of God. Amen. That we are to be reverent and very quiet. Otherwise, it's very disrespectful to God. God is very sensitive. God is very tender. And if you raise your voice towards God, you're going to really offend him. Okay, that's what we have had handed down to us. That's the mindset we have in the UK. And God is actually the exact opposite. He is the strongest being in all of existence. You can't hurt him. You can't offend him. You can't do anything with him with your prayers. He is so strong, so powerful, so resilient. In fact, God says, I want you to come to me day and night. I want you to cry out. I want your heart to be filled with burden and desire and zeal and chutzpah. I want you to cry out to me day and night, day and night. Just like this widow with the judge who didn't care. She was there day and night, banging on his door, banging on his door until she got her answer. And he said, I'm not like that judge. I actually do care about you. I actually do care about justice being done. I actually do care about you overcoming your adversary, the devil. I actually do care. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the son of man comes, will he... Find faith on the earth. And so here we have a very clear depiction by Jesus who knew his father, who saw his father in heaven. He saw the face of his father. He knows his father. And he says, listen, this is what the father desires. He wants you guys, my disciples, to cry out to him day and night with a heart filled with passion. Forget about religiosity. Forget about wearing dog collars and wearing special uniforms and having special titles and kind of whispering your prayer and kind of reading prayers or saying, our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. All this kind of model prayer stuff. He says, forget about that. Cry out to God day and night from your heart. Knock on the door of heaven. Cry out to him. He wants this from you. Amen. And when the church in the UK gets this and understands this, that's when revival breaks out. They understood it in Wales and revival broke out. They understood it in the Hebrides. And revival broke out. They understood it in Los Angeles and revival broke out. Finney understood it. Whitfield understood it. Wesley understood it. Because when you cry out from the soul, you're no longer trying to use your intellect to say kind of thoughtful, poetic prayers that are trying to impress God's ears. God doesn't care about your eloquence. He's the greatest communicator in all of history. He doesn't care about your these and thous and so forths. He cares about your passion. He cares about your heart. And maybe you're here today and you just don't care about the lost. You don't care about God's glory. Maybe you need to be born again. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when God comes on the inside of you and lives on the inside of you, your desires and passions change. They change to godly desires, godly passions. And the more you cry out to God, the greater the chutzpah becomes. The more passion and zeal and fervor you have for prayer. And Jesus likens this judge to God but with the big difference God actually does care about injustice 
Notice the woman would not be put off. She was persistent. She kept knocking on the door. And in the same way, we have to keep on knocking on the door of heaven. We pray for revival until we see revival. Amen. You know, I'm not one of these word of faith people. I think that's a load of cod's wallop. It's nonsense. It's new age. Oh, I'll pray once and I'll just believe and I'll speak it into being. Cod's wallop. Never happens. I've met too many people like that and it never happens. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible tells us to do. We don't just speak it into being and sit back and do nothing. The Bible says we're to cry out day and night until we see it manifested on the earth. That's what faith is. Faith is a fight. It's where you don't give up. Think of Jacob with the angel of the Lord. Jacob wanted to be blessed. The angel of the Lord said, get off. He says, I'm not going to get off. I'm not going to leave you alone until I get blessed. That's faith. Faith is a fight. Faith doesn't let go. Faith says, I'm going to get the blessing. I'm going to get the revival. I'm going to get the power of God. I'm going to get the presence of God. And we can rest upon the promises of God in his word because God says, I want to bless you. I want to fill you with my power. I want to draw close to you so long as you draw close to me. And you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. You see, often people say, I tried praying. It didn't work. That's because you didn't pray properly. You didn't pray with all of your heart. God says, pray with all of your heart and then you will find me. Amen. It's no good praying religious prayers, left, right and set. They don't work. Pray with faith. Pray with chutzpah. Knock on heaven's door. I prayed for a week, pastor. It didn't work. A week? Are you having a laugh? <laughs> Try praying for six months. Fight for six months. Really? God wants me to pray for that? Evan Roberts prayed for 13 years for revival in South Wales. He cried out to God day and night. He was called a madman in his day. His landlady kicked him out of the lodgings because he prayed so loud it shook the rafters of the house. <laughs> Get out, she said. Evan Roberts would be seen walking down the road, crying out to God, crying for the souls of man to be saved. People said, look, there goes mad Evan. Then all of a sudden, 13 years later, after crying out to God day and night, revival broke out and 100,000 people got swept into the kingdom of God. And that revival has impacted millions upon millions of people all over the world. You know, I saw a revival when I was 17 years of age. Many of you know the story. I was in a St. Bridge School at the time, Central School. I was in the sixth form. And I was really burdened because so many of the students just didn't know Christ there. They were headed for a lost eternity and so were the teachers. And the Lord had filled me with his Holy Spirit. And so I had a real concern for these, the, the, the spiritual welfare of these people. So I had a friend called Steve and we decided to, um, in the lunch hour, I think it was a Thursday lunchtime, get together in this classroom. And we were going to share the message of Jesus with people and pray. Well, we started and nobody came along. And so we said, let's pray. And we prayed. And the next week we prayed. Nobody came along. We prayed. We kept praying. And we weren't just praying on the Thursday lunchtime. I mean, I was praying every night. I was praying throughout the day. I was praying in the classroom. Every opportunity I had, I cried out to God for his power and for his presence and his spirit to come down and to fill that place and to fill that school. But for a whole 12 months, nothing happened. And we were crying out to God day and night, like this widow, knocking on the doors of heaven. Give us justice against our adversary, Satan. He has blinded the minds of these people. Give us the power of God. Nothing happened. You could have got discouraged, couldn't you? After 12 months of crying out day and night, you could get discouraged. But I had read the stories of Evan Roberts. I had read the stories of Finney and Whitfield and these other revivalists. And they all say the same thing. We prayed for months. We prayed for years. Nothing happened. It seemed as though the heavens were brass. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. And all of a sudden, boom, the power of God was loosed. So I had faith and I knew that if I kept on praying, something would happen eventually. Well, the following year, my friend Steve left and I was joined by another friend called Aaron. There was always two of us to pray. So me and Aaron just started praying and once again, nothing much was happening. And then all of a sudden, one week, a group of lads came in. And from there, a massive revival sparked and it went all over the school. And the classroom was filled and the drama studio was filled. And we were called to go and preach the gospel to the, the parents of the students of the school. And we did that at the, um, at the Christmas uh, carol service. We preached the gospel to all of the parents who came along. And the power of God was moving so much. The music teacher at the time, Mr. Matthews, he was a Salvation Armyist. And he would come up to me occasionally, very, very quietly say, I can't be seen to be encouraging you, but keep going, well done, sort of thing. And he would kind of whisper that to me. 
But from that time, I've seen three revivals, and each time they're getting more and more powerful. And it's through constant, persistent prayer. Now, maybe you've got something in your life. Maybe it's like blessing. She couldn't move her arm. She prayed about it, prayed about it, prayed about it. God answered her and healed her. Maybe it's you want your son or daughter saved, your husband or wife saved, your mum or dad saved, a work colleague saved. Maybe you want revival in your workplace. You need to get serious with God in prayer. You need to knock on the door of heaven and keep on knocking. And remember, God isn't always going to give you the answer to your prayer straight away. He does this on purpose. Because yes, God will answer your prayer eventually. But in the meantime, he wants to develop your character. And for God, it's all about character. You see this body of ours? It's going to grow old. I don't care how much, kind of much you dye your hair, put makeup on. I'm talking to the men here. Um, I don't care how much you, know, you, you kind of look after yourself. Eventually, you're going to grow old and wrinkly and gray. And eventually, that means your body's breaking down. It's dying. This physical body of ours, I don't care who you are, it's not going to last forever. And it will die. The only thing that carries on into eternity is our soul and spirit, the character that we have developed. So what God wants to do in this life is twofold. Number one, save others through you. And number two, develop you yeah. for the next life. Amen. And so prayer does both of these things. Yeah. Number one, it will release the power of God eventually. You've got to wrestle for the blessing. Secondly, God wants to develop you and make you Christ-like. And he does this through prayer. Prayer is so vital. It's so essential. That's why we have seven prayer meetings a week in this church. And yeah, I just want to encourage all of you. You need to, you need to be coming along to those. If you're not working... Or well, if you're not looking after little ones, you need to be at those prayer meetings. Now, I'm not going to say it once, but you need to be there. Whatever excuse we have why we can't attend prayer, you need to you get rid of that excuse. Because one day we're all going to face Jesus. And he's going to say, why didn't you? Or what excuse will we have? You need to be at those prayer meetings. You need to be at journey, journey night next Saturday night. You need to be encouraging your brothers and sisters. Don't kind of stay in and say, oh, it's dark, it's cold, get a lift. Buy a taxi, whatever you've got to do, get along, come and support your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a family, right? Yeah, we are. Amen. Amen. Notice what Jesus says there, right at the end. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Jesus. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Notice what this is in relation to. Jesus is saying that when he comes again at his second coming, will I find faith? And what kind of faith? It's prayer faith. It's faith where people will pray persistently like this widow. When I come at my second coming, will I find a church that's a praying church? That's a wrestling church that cries out to God for his power and presence. Will I find that? Or will I find a church that doesn't really pray? It just kind of messes around with prayer, messes around with Bible study, has lots of home groups, lots of barbecues, lots of social events, has a nice message about a kind of Jesus on Sunday, but it's not the real biblical Jesus. What kind of church will I find? And from his very question, it kind of makes you think, Ugh. the fact he's questioning this kind of tells me that the, the latter time church that's going to be on the earth just prior to his coming is probably not going to have faith. They're not really going to believe for miracles or the power of God. They're not going to really believe for revival. They're going to just be happy meeting together on a Sunday morning, having teas and coffees afterwards, having social groups, barbecues in the summer, so on and so forth. But they're not really going to be a, a church of prayer. They're not going to be really a church that cries out to God for revival and sees it. Do you think we're living in those sorts of days at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. The Apostle Paul emphasizes Jesus' words in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. He says this, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, 
without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, Paul says, have nothing to do with such people. Now we could look at that and say, well, the world's always been like that. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, people have been unkind and unloving and slanderous and without self-control and brutal and not lovers of the good. And he's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. Unbelievers have always been like this. They always will be. But notice what he says. He's talking about the church. How do we know? Because he says they have a form of godliness. Unbelievers don't have a form of godliness. He's talking about the church. The church in the latter times is going to be a place who loves money, loves wealth, loves pleasure, disobedient. I don't care what the word of God says. I'm going to keep on watching my porn. I don't care what it says. I'm going to keep on getting drunk. I don't care what it says. I'm going to keep sleeping around. I don't care what God says. I'm not frightened of God. God wants me to live in a, a blessed life. Health, wealth and prosperity. Ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> I got the Holy Ghost tingles. <laughs> are we living in that kind of church today? Yeah. You, bet, you, you bet your bottom dollar we are. Look at the, look at the, the, the God channels on television. Look at the ministers on there. What are they preaching all the time? You know, God wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to be rich. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be strong. He wants you to be the boss of your organization. He wants, it's all about this life. It's all about living for today's pleasures. Jesus warned it's going to happen just before he comes. And uh, the last, since probably the Second World War, with a crash in the economy and suddenly the, the kind of, it's starting to kind of gather pace again and manufacture and all of that sort of stuff happening around us. It's crept into the church. You see, I can stand up here and I can preach on a Sunday not to love money, not to love pleasure, not to seek after these things, but to seek God in prayer, to seek God in the Bible study. And many of you will laugh, many of you will smile, many of you will nod your heads and then Tuesday night comes and you're not at the Bible study you've got an excuse why you can't attend the bible study or a prayer meeting will come along and on the sunday you're nodding your head yet yeah, we need to be at the prayer meetings and then the prayer meeting comes and you're not there because you've got an excuse why you can't be there maybe coronation street's on maybe your husband or wife doesn't want you to go maybe you've got children i don't know whatever whatever it is there's an excuse now some excuses are really valid yeah. i'm not talking against those but some are just uh, it's cold it's dark out there Got excuses, something good on telly. Got my hobby, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Oh, I have a quiet time, pastor. God hasn't called you to a quiet time. He's called you to a loud time. He doesn't say have a quiet time with me. He says, cry out to me. Oh, it's in the morning, pastor. Well, God says it's gotta be in the morning and in the evening, day and night. How's your prayer life going? You see, when I preach the word of God, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to make you like me. I hope you do like me, but <laughs> if I wanted you to like me, I wouldn't be preaching messages like this. Messages that make you feel bad. But the thing is, I really care about you. I don't want any of you to miss it. I don't want any of you to end up in hell. I don't want any of you to stand before God on the day of judgment and he looks at you and says, I don't know you. But Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name and drive out demons and do all of these? I don't know. I don't know who you are. I've never had a relationship with you. You never obeyed me. Oh God, but I love you. I love you. I love you. No, you don't love me because to love me is to obey my commandments. And you don't obey my commandments. You listen to the sermons and you nod your head. You read my Bible and you smile, but you don't obey them. I want to challenge you this morning, a real challenge, because this is life and death for all of us. Do you live 
the type of life that Christ expects from us? Or do you have a form of godliness, but you deny its power by the way you live? We are called to prayer, to have relationship with God day and night, to be so moved by his spirit that we cry out day and night for the souls of the lost. Samuel Chadwick, and I close with his quote, he says this, there is no power like that of prevailing prayer, of Abraham pleading for Sodom, Jacob wrestling in the stillness of the night, Moses standing in the breach, Hannah intoxicated with sorrow, David heartbroken with remorse and grief, Jesus in sweat of blood. Add to this list from the records of the church your personal observation and experience, and always there is the cost of passion unto blood. Such prayer prevails. It turns ordinary mortals into men of power. It brings power. It brings fire. It brings rain. It brings life. It brings God.